Screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival in July is a film called Love Charlie, the, Ro the Rise and Fall of Charlie Trotter, Chef Charlie Trotter. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the producer of the film, Renee Frigo, and the, uh, I suppose you could say, lead actress, the uh, the first wife of Charlie Trotter, Lisa Ehrlich. Um, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> this is such a comprehensive uh, uh, documentary about uh, Chef Charlie Trotter, uh, his rise and fall, um, uh, and such an intriguing look at this man. How did the documentary first come about? Um, I was looking at documentaries about chefs in 2017, and I was not in the film business, but uh, I was wondering why there wasn't a documentary about Chef Charlie Trotter because I felt he was so relevant to all the things we take for granted in dining. And so I asked around and uh, people asked me who was Charlie and I couldn't believe people didn't know who he was. So I decided um, to make the documentary and start the uh, film company that I own today. Uh-huh. And Lisa, at what point did you get involved with the film? Well, you might say I, I got involved in the film when I uh, decided to save all those letters in a banker's box that I stored in my garage for like 40 years. But um, uh, the the film for me started um, actually at Charlie's uh, memorial service when I connected with uh, Ray Harris, who be became the executive producer of the film. And I told a couple stories um, about Charlie that they didn't know about the early days and mentioned that I had these letters. And then when Renee was uh, debuting the, sh the film short uh, in, in Sonoma, Ray c called me and asked me if I would go check it out. And uh, so that's how I ended up connecting with Renee. And uh, at first I was a little... Uh, apprehensive about sharing all these letters, but I wasn't even sure. There were different kinds of plans at the beginning. It wasn't clear that it was going to be the film it is today. Um, I think COVID had had something to do with it. Um, and so I I dragged these these films out of the box, uh, out of the the um, the letters out of the box where they they'd been stored, and I spread them out over my entire house and kind of had a. a realization of how um just how much how much history was there it's a really an incredible history and uh, as i said it's such a comprehensive look i mean so renee in in producing uh the film uh it it's so interesting the uh archival footage and uh, material, everything that was found that uh, I know was directed by Rebecca Halpern. But uh, tell me about that process of uh, gathering all that information, including Lisa's letters, et cetera, to be able to make the film. Well, Lisa was, Lisa was really critical because what we found was that Charlie wrote, Charlie wrote to Lisa a lot. There were hundreds of letters that Lisa shared with us and so we became that became our search is to find out who else did he write to and we gathered all of these letters and he basically was able to tell his story in the film through his own letters uh, and so we used that as a narrative and then we also animated the postcards he wrote in fact every image in the movie is an image that charlie mailed to somebody it's from a postcard so Every is every time you see a postcard that's animated or a, an image that reflects something in a song or something that he did, um, we're just using the images he chose one day to mail to somebody. Uh, so yeah, it was a it was a huge process. Um, Rebecca made a collage, and you'll see it in the film, of everything we accumulated on her dining room table, and it was massive. And we moved it to a studio and and shot it. I did a table shoot too of that of all the archives. That, that is amazing. And and it's great to see the home movie footage and other early footage of Charlie's life. Yeah, those were great that his brother had saved all the eight millimeter um, videos. So we had, you know, Charlie um, when he was younger as Chuck 
And then um, we had all the footage from all of his special events that he did. So we could use that too. So yeah, it was really, it was, it was a lot to go through, but it was also, um, like I said, it was really good that Lisa came in to sort of set us up with who he was as Chuck before he became a professional. Yes, yeah. Chuck. <laughs> yeah. In terms of what was involved with the letters, though, they were really, really hard to read. He had this tortured, tiny, tiny handwriting. He would cross stuff out. Um, and often he was writing a lot on um, chocolate wrappers or um, those mailers that you use internationally that end up like getting folded onto their piece of paper that folds over and then glues. And so it was often when you reopen those things, they ended up in multiple pieces <laughs> that you had to tape back together. So um, a lot of weekends spent um, uh, tra translating them. All of them were individually scanned and um, the director had them all transcribed and then we had to read them. So I spent weekend after weekend going back through my 20 year old self and uh, <laughs> which is rather sobering. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> How interesting. So Lisa, for you being interviewed about uh, Charlie and about uh, your relationship with him and, and everything, um, that must have been uh, a bittersweet sort of uh, situation for you. Tell, tell me about all that process for you. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you you don't realize at the time, especially when you're so young, um, what what you're giving up sometimes when you are um, in a, a situation that's difficult. And I don't regret the decisions that I made, but sometimes I think that if Charlie and I had been forced to sit in a room and read all the letters and I'd written him back, that we might have... Um, been uh, maybe even more circumspect about things. So it was uh, definitely a sense of loss when I went back and, and read it. And I'm in sorrow because I miss, I miss Chuck. I, um, you know, consider him um, until the day he passed away to be one of my best, greatest friends of all time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, very sad, but but uh, affirming as well at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm trying to get my head around Charlie Trotter or Chuck Trotter um, as a chef uh, in the pantheon of all the chefs around at the time and so on. What what drove him and and what was it about him that made him so charismatic in many respects? You want to take that? So you want to? I'd be interested in in your perspective, Renee. Um, well, Charlie, at the time I met him, I, I booked his kitchen table and he was the number one restaurant in the world uh, per wine spectator. And so I had an olive oil at the time called Lucini and I brought it over in my purse and wanted to give it to him because I grew up in Chicago and I knew he was like Michael Jordan or Oprah. He was Charlie Trotter. He created, you know, put Chicago on the map for fine dining. And so I gave him the bottle and um, and he sort of changed my life that night. And that's why 20 years later, you know, we're here because I kind of wanted to uh, pay it forward for his legacy. Um, but that at that moment, um, every chef looked up to Charlie. I mean, to the level of that, I would say to somebody, um, you know, any chef on television, oh, you know, Charlie Trotter uses this and oh, Charlie uses this, you know, okay. And it was like, so he opened so many doors for me. And uh, eventually even uh, Oprah's chef loved it, gave it to Oprah, had me on the show. I mean, it was, he really was that respected. Um, so yeah, he was all about excellence. And I think for me, I also wanted to share what it takes to achieve that excellence with the world and the sacrifices he had to make, not just work hard, but just what what he had to let go of to get there. And uh, yeah, it was very isolating. And, um, you know, I think Lisa could probably give you a lot more insight. Yeah. It was like so, personally. I just feel like he's such an, en an enigmatic person. And I think it does, you know, people watch the film uh, uh, come away with sometimes as many questions about him as answers as do people who love him the most, because 
he was an intensely driven person. And, and I think a lot of that came uh, from his um, relationship with his dad and uh, wanting to make his dad, you know, proud of him. Um, but it also just, it was how he was wired. And um, so he was an, he was an intense perfectionist or excellentist. Um, and, and, and that was lonely. And yet he touched so many people and, and in a way that people uh, he loved as intensely as he cooked. And um, when that spotlight shone on you, it was an incredible and very empowering thing. And, um, I, you know, I was just thinking about Tetsuya, who um, was, you know, uh, from Australia. And, uh, you know, the, the way that they met and, and how Charlie, the guy calls him at his hotel, and then Charlie immediately goes over, has all these other plans, but he drops everything to go and eat at this guy's restaurant and become for the, you know, the rest of his days, like an incredible friend of the guys. Like Charlie had that ability to just, when he saw something in somebody, a spark, an energy, a, a will, a desire to be, uh, uh, to, to become the very best version of themselves. He wanted to go to, he would do anything he could It's sort of in his power to help them on that path. And that was the, the thing I think that connected all these people to him. Cause you think to yourself, this is a, one of the very, very lonely person and yet, and yet so loved and, and loved and beloved. Exactly. Uh, and that certainly comes through in, in the documentary. I mean, as you say, he was really highly driven. He traveled overseas. He'd uh, written lots of books, um, cookbooks and so on. And uh, uh, I, I found it quite incredible, especially the rivalry he had with uh, uh, a chef or cook that he took on board who eventually became his uh, Michelin rival, which I found so interesting in the story. Yeah, it was great that Grant agreed to uh, be interviewed and tell that story. Yeah. What, what, Charlie, what Charlie did not do was not easy for him was was being in partnership. And I think that was the hardest thing. He didn't he was um, definitely a one man show when it came to his his art, his craft. Mm. And so I think that was the the part where that was hard for him was um, that he was driven, he had his vision and that really didn't allow for uh, other cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> I, I, I suppose in some respects, a, a stereotype of a chef uh, being very much idiosyncratic, being uh, the person in charge and uh, everyone else has to follow or they're not there anymore. <laughs> One of his favorite sayings is it's my way or the highway. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, and Renee, uh, you also found some great people to interview, Wolfgang Puck and, and so many others who were willing yeah. to talk about uh, Charlie, et cetera. That, putting all of that together must have been uh, quite a, a task for you. Yeah, it was hard because we started shooting on the first day of COVID. So we actually had more people willing to speak to us that we just couldn't reach and we couldn't get to because of COVID. Um, but yeah, it was great to have Wolfgang um, speak about Charlie, you know, the first in, in so many ways of what he did as for America in terms of cuisine. And uh and he was the first to do degustation menus and the first to do the vegetarian menus, you know, um, the table in the kitchen, you know, all of that. Being really personal with who's in that restaurant tonight and knowing their background before Google, you know, um, it was it was kind of incredible the level of service he he created. There's a chef actually in New Zealand, Peter Gordon, who told me a story that um he went to charlie's restaurant and and uh he noticed the val valet guys picking up trash on the way to work about four blocks away from the restaurant and he, he asked them about it he said oh no charlie has taught us you know you're on duty four blocks from this restaurant yeah 
And that was, that was what they all, you know, they all believed. I mean, they cleaned the dumpsters of their neighbors, the dumpsters for their neighbors in the alley so that rats wouldn't go into the neighbor's alley and then it would dumpsters and come to theirs. You know, I mean, the level of uh, excellence <laughs> is, was always higher than expected. Yes, yes. No, is that certainly comes through uh, very much the uh, attention to detail, excellence, and everything that uh, that Charlie was part of. Um, I, I mean, in some respects, uh, there is sadness, of course, in the film in terms of his uh, illness and uh, uh, that he didn't look after himself particularly well, and uh, uh, and that obviously affected uh, you, but also in particular Lisa. It was really surprising to me to see um, Charlie's, um, the changes, because he had always been so fastidious about his diet and his health. I mean, he he, he would not, he would sort of save up before he ate out um, at a big blowout restaurant. And he tended to subsist on yogurt and fruit and uh, granola and go on these long runs and uh, you know, definitely a lot of uh, coffee, ice cream and, and coffee. But he was um, a very disciplined person who, who always uh, had a very um, kind of strict schedule and, and way of life and, and discipline about how he um, exercised and everything. But I think, um, you know, I think that the health problem started uh, Larry Stone in, in the movie talks about it. Um, the sommelier who uh, who took over after I left, um, but he he uh, you know I think there were there were probably a series of strokes that impacted him um, years before the um, you know he he finally passed away that that impacted uh, him in some different ways. Yeah, so, I'll yeah. be curious. Peter, what people, what the audience in Australia thinks of the film, because my recollection of um, being around uh, that part of the world is that it's unlike America. In America, they ask you what you do and they attach your identity to what you do, but you don't see that in other countries. And I, I think when Charlie's restaurant closed, Grant says it, you know, Charlie closed. Mm -hmm. And he attached all of his identity to what he did. And I think a lot of Americans relate to that. I wonder if it's if it's just a very modern concept that we all work so hard and we we all relate to it, or if it's different in different countries. Yeah. What do you no. Yeah, no. In Australia, we we also pretty much look at uh, work and uh, and life as uh, as identity, and we identify with that uh, very much. That uh, um, I mean, we have so many cooking and chef uh, programs uh, on Australian television, reality TV, and so on. So that uh, it's a very strong identifier for people. That ah, uh, oh, you're a chef, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So, uh, Renee, working with um, Rebecca, uh, with all the footage that you shot uh, uh, over the years and uh, the archival footage, the interviews, etc., cetera, um, tell me about the editing process, because putting the uh, documentary together to decide the final edit, that must have been quite a challenge. Gosh, it is. I oh, I think about it often. You know, we could have made a ten series docu series with all the stuff we had. Um, no, I think Rebecca did an amazing job. You know, this did start as a short, and I thought that's all we would get with, um, you know, with the with Sonoma F Film Festival, and I thought that would be it. And then, uh, like I said, Lisa and Ray came on, and and it was we had to make a feature and we were able to raise the money to hire Rebecca, who's amazing. Um, and interestingly enough, she comes from true crime. And so she had this approach to the filmmaking that was really investigative and she didn't know Charlie, which was kind of nice because she could really show, you know, she could not be biased. I mean, she shows warts and all in the film. And uh, so that was good for me because I you know 
I had to like let I give her creative control to do that. So it was it was a good it was a good process. And we had an excellent editor who just won an award, Daniel Algorin. And uh, yeah, it's it was it was fun to get to that process. Uh huh. Lisa, you were going to say something. Well, yeah, I mean, just that it was important to to me and also to um, uh, as well as uh, uh, from what I understand to Donnelly and Anne that, that um, Trotter, um, that it be an honest um, uh, look at Charlie and not um, simply, I mean, it could have been something that was more of like a memorial tribute to, to Charlie and that wouldn't have been believable. And yet something that was also respectful. And one of the things that um, I, I know that Rebecca, you know, grappled with was that he did so much humanitarian work and so much good, uh, you know, put through what, uh, probably somewhere around 40,000 um, young people have received scholarships through the uh, foundation mm. um, that, that in his name. And uh, yet it, it, if you, uh, focused on that and, and that part is at the very end but it would have seemed very almost self-serving you know that it, it needed to really talk more about who who he was as a man and, and, and to try to understand the drivers and also the the prices that he paid for for what he achieved to mm. it's both a cautionary tale and also a tribute at the same time yes mm -hmm definitely comes through that way um so so lisa how did you respond to seeing the final version of uh, the film I, I honestly it was really pretty shocking to me and very emotional mm. and 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 it's interesting because i saw it maybe for the 12th or 14th time just recently in chicago and i was with ann trotter and we both cried oh. i mean every time it's just very it it it's funny because it's a, it's a journey and and um, I notice different things about the film. I'm more and more um, uh, convinced of Rebecca Halpern's brilliance <laughs> every time I see it. I'm like, oh, I can't believe she put this in or, or, you know, and I know there was so much that she wanted to put in that didn't make it into the film and people she wanted to interview that she wasn't able to um, interview. And, and, and still there was so much material, so much material. I mean, I had those postcards up in the wall of my apartment at my house and it covered an entire wall. And that was just the ones I had. So the thing that she had was just incredibly amazing that that collage that she put together. And that was still just a fraction of what she drew on to, to yeah. paint a picture. And, you know, it, it's it's one vision of of, who he was but I think a, just about every person that I know that knew him well that's seen the movie feel very moved mm. it, it certainly is very moving so uh, the film will be screening in July in Melbourne as part of the uh, uh, Melbourne Documentary Film Festival and of course by the sounds of it, it the, the film has screened in many other places and uh, I'm interested in the responses that audiences have given uh, to the film, especially the uh, the uh, cooking community, if you like to put it that way. <laughs> yeah, well, we were just we were just nominated uh, for best documentary for a James Beard Award, which is a, a tremendous honor. Um, we won two Taste Awards. Uh, we've won an Audience Award at the S San Diego Film Festival, and. Um, best of you know the best of the fest award at chicago um there's been lots of accolades like that coming in and what's amazing to me though is that chefs are really celebrating this movie they're really watching it and it's still in the top 40 on apple itunes right now um and it's you know it's fairly been out since November, you know, since, uh, well, not November, but it's been out um, for a year now. So we're, we're really excited that people, especially chefs are sort of sharing it with their restaurants and their colleagues and the hospitality community. So it's been a, it's been great. It's been fun. It's been and really I want to say, Peter, it is available online to everyone in Australia. Um, in the month of July, 
you don't have to be in Melbourne to be able to watch it. Mm. So it's just every that's... day I'm getting um, connected, uh, reconnected with people from from the past. Um, for example, a, a professor of mine from Northwestern University <laughs> who saw the movie from back when I, you know, when I pulled out and uh, and had me as a student. It's just been l lovely to reconnect with all these people, and and all, all, I'm getting um, messaged from different chefs locally, nationally, internationally, and friends in France begging to see the movie when can they watch it and so it's it's beautiful it, it's connected uh the community in a way where i think people realized you know this year it'll be 10 years since he passed away and and uh um art smith who was uh, a supporter of charlie's and and uh and friend etc he he he's in the film and he he's at the very end paying tribute to Charlie. And he he made a, a, a statement to me that I really found touching. He said, there's pro not a single fine dining restaurant in the United States that hasn't been touched by Charlie. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's nice that Charlie's memories being kept alive through the film. They certainly are. It's a, it is quite a, an extensive and incredible film. So uh, well done uh, on uh, putting all that together and, and winning all those accolades and uh, uh, et cetera. And now in Australia, we can see it. Uh, just a quick question, Renee, are you uh, involved in any other films at the moment? I am. I'm, uh, I'm working on actually another uh, documentary in the food related area about a woman named Marcella Hazan who brought Italian cooking to America. Um, but I also have a couple others, you know, uh, a project with um, the, the director I worked with on Tesla um, that starred Ethan Hawke. And I've got another one with um, about Mary Tyler Moore, which ah. is a, a con in America. Yes. Ah, so. Okay. Yeah. Some really okay. interesting. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Some really interesting projects. They they sound great, but uh, uh, at the moment we're talking about this major project, which is uh, screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival in July. Love Charlie: The Rise and Fall of Chef Charlie Trotter, and we've been speaking to the producer Renee Frigo and to uh, Charlie's first wife, and features prominently in the film Lisa Ehrlich. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you, Peter, for having us. It's been a Thank pleasure. You, all the best. Bye-bye. Appreciate it. Bye. Okay.